Welcome, everyone. We're back. Let's talk about politics and governance. Today, we focus on how the European Commission has evolved from a collaborative body to a global force, okay. navigating many challenges lately, such as COVID-19, climate change, the war in Ukraine. And I have invited Marco Sidi uh, to explore the European Union's energy strategies okay, and its embrace of strategic partnerships with like-minded countries. So we're going to focus on the EU's energy strategies. Marco, welcome to our episode. Thank you very much for having me. Hi. Marco, tell us about the importance of studying the European Union's energy strategies after all these recent crises. Well, energy is a central factor in EU policy today. Uh, it is the it has been a top priority of the uh, Commission headed by Ursula von der Leyen. Um, energy transition is fundamental to tackle climate change. Uh, so one of the key questions is how geopolitical competition, which is rising today, affects uh, this constellation. Um, we hear a lot of uh, talk about uh, de-risking strategic autonomy and uh, we perceive even in this talk a contradiction with the long-standing uh, rhetoric on uh, trade and multilateralism. Um, so how does that affect a field energy transition where cooperation would be fundamental to ensure that it happens on a global level. And how does this play a role in the EU's global strategies? Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, geopolitical competition. You write in your article that the existing literature on the EU's energy policy has largely focused on its economic and environmental dimensions while paying less attention to its geopolitical aspects. So is this correct? Yeah, this is correct. And it's um, it's also natural because geopolitical competition uh, has been rising in recent years. So before we, we still live in this period of uh, um, post-Cold War uh, relative uh, call. And now this has changed and it is uh, really uh, radically influencing also the way uh, EU policymakers uh, reason. Uh, again, if we just think about strategic, strategic autonomy as opposed to uh, uh, trade openness, which was the mantra of your policymakers uh, until recently. Mm -hmm. Let's then focus on your article. So what are the main highlights, the main conclusions of your study? Well, the main findings are that uh, we see, especially in the last few years, and particularly from 2022, so following uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine, we see a shift, a rhetorical shift from uh, broad multilateralism uh, and open strategic autonomy to more narrowly defined strategic partnerships with like-minded countries. Um, you know, this at the rhetorical level. So uh, partnerships with the US, Canada, Japan, uh, policy practice, we can say still uh, quite diverse. We do see a quest for partnership also with Qatar, for example, for the uh, import of liquefied natural gas, uh, which is not necessarily a like-minded country <laughs> on many issues and has also been quite controversial, if you remember the Qatar gate in the European Parliament uh, last year. Uh, so this is the, the main point. Uh, the article then goes into uh, the details of, um, of how this rhetorical change has, take, has taken place in various uh, documents. And I look uh, um, at documents between 2019, published between 2019 and 2023. Uh, um, so the European Green Deal communication is one of the earliest documents. Uh, and I get to the uh, Green Deal uh, industrial plan. Uh, which uh, is one of the most recent uh, pieces of policy uh, strategy and is now being substantiated by uh, uh, regulations. And so the legal, you know, the Critical Raw Materials Act, uh, the Net Zero Industry uh, Act. Um, so one finds um, quite a lot of information about uh, these strategies uh, in the article and specifically how they relate to the foreign policy uh, geopolitics conundrum. It's uh, 
a potential implication of this. So you mentioned this, these strategies, these documents that you mentioned. A potential implication you uh, reference in your article is um, how, to figure out how the European Union will balance both geopolitical aspects and the climate climate aspects of its energy policy. So let us know more about this balance and you know potential other practical implications. Yes, so the European Union is trying to square the circle by um, um, focusing on green partnerships, mm -hmm. um, especially with neighboring countries, uh, for example, in North Africa, um, simply because it's, it's easier, you know, to access energy, green energy produced in these regions. Um, at the same time, there are several issues. Um, the EU cannot get rid of its fossil fuel demand uh, so quickly. Mm -hmm. So if you try to replace such a large supplier as Russia, uh, you need to find um, oil and gas uh, elsewhere. And uh, so this is the geopolitics uh, side. So we see some investments, not simply on uh, uh, improving renewable energy production or energy efficiency, uh, but also on, for example, new LNG terminals, uh, terminals to import uh, um, LNG from far away, um, from the US, Qatar. Uh, we can think of uh, the case of Germany, which did not have a single LNG terminal in, in early uh, 2022. Russia was its main gas provider, and suddenly, uh, it had to change this and try to find uh, um, gas somewhere else. By the way, this has been uh, quite successful. Uh, however, it has come at a cost. Uh, the cost being uh, less uh, energy available and at a higher uh, price. And a cost that we see reflected uh, on energy prices, uh, on uh, the performance also of the German economy, the German industry and potentially um, also having social implications and political implications, potentially in, in also in the European elections this year. And with all these uh, consequences and implications you mentioned, uh, if anyone would ask you recommendations for what to study next, next what would you suggest? Well, we need to uh, uh, try to understand the impact that um, the current policies will have on the um, unrolling, uh, you know, of policies for the energy transition. Um, once again, if the EU pursues strategic autonomy, um, for example, in um, the deployment of renewables, in the critical minerals that you need uh, uh, to produce uh, semiconductors, um, uh, wind turbines, and so on. Is this going to have an impact in how much time you need uh, to actually uh, implement the energy transition? Um, or will it have an impact on, uh, on the cost, on prices, uh, which again is also likely to delay the whole thing? Um, so it is important to understand uh, the trade-off uh, uh, and uh, try to find a way to combine the need for more uh, autonomy with uh, the need to actually prioritize climate action. Perfect. Um, this has been, Marco, a very straight to the point episode, exactly what we like to do. But a last challenge for you. If you had to sum up this episode in one or two sentences, what would it be? Well, um, so overall, uh, um, we can say that uh, European energy uh, and climate policy um, rose to prominence uh, in 2019. So exactly uh, at the beginning of the current electoral cycle at the European level, with European Parliament elections. And um, following this, following uh, um, um, activist protests also and movements like um, um, Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for Future, uh, there was a, a practical effect also on EU policy and we saw the Green Deal and a lot of uh, strategies and policies to accelerate the energy transition. Now, uh, five years on, um, this momentum is waning. 
uh, we see that actually we are experiencing a, a backlash. And uh, part of the, the reason for this is geopolitics. Uh, there's other priorities. So if, I, if you want, I can do this again because it wasn't one or two sentences. It was actually longer than the entire episode. It's okay. No worries, no worries. At least the content's there and that's the most important. The message has passed. Um, Marco, thank you very much. Sure. Thanks for having me. Sure. For um, those who are watching us on, on uh, YouTube, the Let's Talk About Politics and Governance website uh, provides you with the study that Marco and I uh, just chatted about. Uh, and also all the channels in which you can listen to these uh, to these episodes. If you want to uh, subscribe to our newsletter, you can also do that and follow us on Twitter at Cogitatio LTA.